In this video, I'm going to be revealing a number of underrated wines that I've enjoyed recently. Some of these wines are from world-class producers that fly under the radar, while others are from smaller, up-and-coming producers with which you may not yet be familiar. Others are from grapes or regions that are underappreciated. But I'm not messing around today since it's a holiday weekend, so let's get started. When it comes to wines from Piedmont, Italy, many wine collectors that I know tend to focus exclusively on the Nebbiola-based wines such as Barolo and Barbaresco. But I think this is a mistake, as there's also lots of very high-quality, underrated Barbera being produced. Of course, as with everything else, it's important not to generalize. In Piedmont, there's three times more Barbera being produced than Nebbiolo. Barbera is also capable of producing very high yields, and so there are a number of uninspiring, inexpensive examples of Barbera being produced as well. Those are not the wines that I'm talking about in this video. However, there's also some outstanding examples of Barbera that are produced by high-quality producers that restrict yields and treat it with the respect that it deserves. One of the things I like best about Barbera is that it's the perfect choice when you're at an Italian restaurant. This is so because the prices tend to be quite reasonable, even with a restaurant markup. In addition, it's naturally high in acidity and low in tannin, which means that it doesn't take a long time to open up, and you can enjoy it even in its youth. But due to the high acidity, it's also capable of aging as well, particularly if the producer restricted yields and it has some impressive depth and concentration. Just this past week, I was reminded about how age-worthy and impressive Barbera can be. I tried two different Barberas, one from 1997 and one from 1998. Both were from a high-quality producer named Bava, and both were extremely impressive. In fact, I blinded one of them as a Nebbiolo-based wine from about 20 to 25 years ago. In addition to Bava, some of my other favorite producers of high-quality Barbera include Giacomo Conterno, Roberto Vuorzio, and also Michele Chiarlo. The best part about these wines is that most of them are available for $30 to $50 per bottle in the United States, although the Conterno wines are probably going to be more expensive than that. But definitely on a going forward basis, at least for my own collection, I plan to buy a lot more Barbera, especially on release, and then enjoy some of it while it's young, but also put some bottles away so I can enjoy some after it has time to develop some additional complexity in the cellar. While fall is rapidly approaching, it's still crazy hot where I live in Texas, so I'm still in a bit of a Chablis kick. So earlier this week when I was at dinner, I ordered a Premier Cru Chablis from the 2022 vintage from a producer named Domaine Jean-Marc Brocard. Of course, Chablis doesn't get the same attention and notoriety as White Burgundy from further south, which is what makes it an ideal candidate for inclusion in this video. Demand Jean-Marc Bocard was founded back in 1973. It's a big proponent of organic and biodynamic practices, and its goal is to make wines that are precise, powerful, and concentrated, but yet which are also fresh with ample acidity. I've found that this producer oftentimes has wines that offer high quality at their price point. The vineyard name for this particular Premier Cru means Mount of Thunder, and it's definitely my favorite Premier Cru Chablis from Jean-Marc Bocard. This vineyard is ideally situated next to the Valley of Grand Cruz. This was an impressive mineral-driven Chablis with citrus and floral notes. On the palate, it was rich and concentrated, but there was also ample acidity and freshness. This is a wine that sells for retail at about $45 per bottle in the United States. The 2021 vintage is also well worth seeking out if you can find it, although you may pay a bit more for that one. The 2021 vintage receives some notable high scores, even from Berghound, which is certainly not known for passing out high scores easily. Jean-Marc Bocard also has an enjoyable lower price Chablis that's organic and sells for around $25 per bottle. That one is called Bocard St. Clair Chablis. While there are a number of Lebanese wine producers that make wines that I enjoy, particularly when enjoying Lebanese cuisine, 
My favorite is undoubtedly still the benchmark producer from Lebanon, namely Chateau Muser. Chateau Muser is located in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley. The flagship Muser wine is a blend that consists of Cabernet Sauvignon, Cinso, and Carignan that was planted way back in the 1930s. The vineyards that produce the fruit for this impressive wine are located at the southern end of the Bekaa Valley, and the soils are gravel over limestone, which is ideal for viticulture. Muser uses organic principles in the vineyard and has a non-interventionist approach to winemaking. The grapes for Musar's flagship red wine are fermented separately in concrete vats. They're racked about six months after harvest. After that, they mature for at least a year in French oak barriques, only a small percentage of which are new. After that, they spend a substantial time in bottle, at least three to four years, before finally being released seven years after harvest. So the current release is the 2017 vintage. The Musar style is definitely influenced by Bordeaux, as one of the original owners was friends with Ronald Barton from Blangua Barton. In addition, one of their longtime winemakers spent a substantial amount of time studying and learning to make wine in Bordeaux. And in fact, when I'm tasting an aged expression of Musar, it often reminds me of a Bordeaux, but with more rusticity. This past week, I tried the 1999 vintage on two different occasions, and it was showing extremely well. This is a wine that's just now beginning to hit its stride, and the great thing about it is because they released some library vintages, you can still get this wine in the market for around $85 per bottle in the United States. In addition, Broadbent, the distributor, does a tremendous job getting this wine on restaurant lists, and sommeliers all over the world are very excited to have this wine on their list because it's a unique and interesting wine, and it's also fairly cost-effective. If you prefer to spend a little bit less, you can get the new releases for around $60 per bottle, but you'll definitely need to plan to let those age in your cellar for a substantial period of time to enjoy them at their peak. As the winery advises, if you give the wines more time, they will give you more joy. If you're going to be buying younger vintages of Musar to put away, you may also want to consider half bottles as those will mature a little bit more rapidly than the standard bottlings. In some cases, I recall that some viewers also complained about Musar wines in the fact that they had some bottle variation. I've had the wines dozens of times and they've been remarkably consistent for me and I've never had any bad experiences with them personally. The one thing I will note, however, is when I order the wines at a restaurant, I do so at the very beginning of a meal so that they can decant for at least an hour or so before I start enjoying the wine. As with some high quality Bordeaux, oftentimes this wine needs a lot of air to show its best. So if you just do a pop and pour, it's not gonna be a surprise if your wine doesn't show its best under those circumstances. The next underrated wine comes from a world-class producer that makes small amounts of incredibly high quality wine from some of the best Grand Cru vineyards in his region, yet these wines sell for an extremely reasonable $59 per bottle. If you're interested in wine recommendations, wine collecting strategies, and learning more about wine, please do subscribe to my channel. I've been collecting wine for more than 15 years and also have a level four diploma from the WSET. So I have both formal certification as well as substantial practical knowledge from the School of Hard Knocks. Domains in Umbrech is one of the top producers in Alsace. It traces its history way back to 1620. Today, it owns around 42 hectares of vines, many of which are located in some of the top Grand Cru sites in Alsace. I recently had the opportunity to taste on pre-arrival the 2020 Zin Umbrecht Summerberg Grand Cru Riesling. This wine was very impressive and sells for right around $59 per bottle on pre-release. Summerberg is a Grand Cru vineyard and Zin Umbrecht acquired a small parcel in this vineyard back in 2010. This is a south-facing vineyard with steep slopes and granite soils. Zindubrush replanted this vineyard to Riesling in 2013 at high density using massal selection from the Grand Cru brand. They have been farming this site biodynamically since then. 
while they only produce a relatively modest quantity of this wine now, they recently acquired some additional plots in Summerberg. While those plots will need to be replanted as well, they will eventually be able to produce a larger volume of this excellent Grand Cru Riesling. 2020 was a warmer vintage in Alsace, but yet this wine comes in at a reasonable 12.4% alcohol by volume. This is an intensely concentrated mineral driven wine with descriptors that include pineapple, peach, pear, floral notes, and honey. But despite this honey descriptor, this wine is bone dry. Just an extremely impressive wine and one that will undoubtedly get even better with additional bottle aging. The next underrated wine comes from a producer whose wines have received high critical acclaim, but which does not yet have substantial name recognition, largely because it's fairly small and also because its first vintage was just in 2016. This producer is located in the prestigious Santa Rita Hills AVA in Santa Barbara County, and they have a 285 acre estate that's located only about eight miles from the Pacific Ocean. Of these 285 acres, 40 are planted to vine, and the proximity to the cool Pacific Ocean definitely has a substantial impact on the vineyards. Their vines were first planted in 2013, and their first vintage was 2016. 2021 was an extremely strong vintage in Santa Barbara County, and the 2021 bottlings for Donica are available in the market now, so this is an excellent time to try the wines. I had the opportunity to taste the entire Danica lineup at Texam earlier this week, which consists of two different bottlings of Chardonnay, two different bottlings of Pinot Noir, as well as some Syrah and Gamay. While I enjoyed the entire lineup, it was the Pinot Noir that was the standout, in my opinion. Since both of the Danica Pinot Noir wines were extremely impressive, I'm going to discuss each of them in turn. They sell for different price points, with the entry-level Pinot selling for around $35 per bottle, and the Estate Pinot Noir selling for about double that. Despite the fact that the Donica Santa Rita Hills Pinot Noir does not have the term Estate in the title, in the 2021 vintage, this wine was nevertheless produced exclusively from Estate Fruit. This wine received tremendous critical acclaim for a wine that sells for only around $35 per bottle, and indeed it was quite impressive. It had lots of red fruit, mixed spice, and impressive freshness. While the Santa Rita Hills Pinot Noir from Donica was definitely very impressive, especially for the price point, the Estate Pinot Noir was definitely a level up. In fact, I was so impressed this is one of only three wines during the entire Texam conference that I asked to revisit. This wine comes exclusively from fruit that's farmed organically on the estate's hillside blocks. There's a variety of different clones that contribute to this blend, including Swan, Pomard, Calera, 115, and 667. This blending of fruit from different clones definitely helps to add complexity to this impressive wine. There were numerous discrete descriptors, including pomegranate, orange peel, red cherry, crushed rock, savory herbs such as sage and thyme, as well as Earl Grey tea. This wine was intensely concentrated, yet also elegant. While this wine is extremely impressive now, it's definitely an age-worthy wine that will cruise in your cellar for at least a decade. This wine matures for 15 months in small oak barrels, 20% of which are new, and they use 15% whole cluster fermentation for this wine. This is definitely an exciting young producer, and I'm definitely impressed with how complex some of their wines are, despite the fact that the vines are only around eight years old. If you enjoy Pinot Noir, I would encourage you to at least try the Santa Rita Hills Pinot Noir bottling that sells for around $35 per bottle. And in the meantime, if you happen to find yourself in the Los Olivos area, be sure to stop by their tasting room so you can try the lineup as well. Due to all the attention and acclaim given to Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Sauvignon from nearby Sonoma County can oftentimes be underrated. For example, there's an excellent expression of Cabernet Sauvignon from a producer that first started in Napa Valley back in 2013. 
This producer is located in St. Helena, but they also have vineyard sources throughout Sonoma County, including some prestigious sites in Sonoma Valley, Alexander Valley, and Knights Valley. Senegal has also assembled a dream team to help in the vineyard and in the winery. Its vineyards are run by Jim Barber, and the winemaker learned from David Abreu, Michelle Roland, and Philippe Melka. While the 2021 Senegal Details Sonoma County Cabernet Sauvignon is labeled a Cabernet Sauvignon because it has 80% Cabernet, it is actually an intriguing red blend that also includes Merlot, Malbec, Petit Verdot, Petit Syrah, as well as Cabernet Franc. This wine matured for 16 months in 55% new French oak. It is a big hedonistic wine, however, and the alcohol by volume is 14.8%. This wine received an impressive 93-point score from Jeb Dunnock, yet sells for a reasonable $49 per bottle. This wine compares favorably to many Cabernet Sauvignons from Napa Valley that sell for more than double that price point. While this wine is already enjoyable now, it's one you can definitely age for at least five to seven years. If you enjoyed this video and you're interested in more underrated wine recommendations, please be sure to check out this video that's linked above.